I would love to welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Um, it's gotten very chilly um, here in the D.C. area, and we're supposed to have snow on Sunday, and I thought we were ready for spring, but whatever. Um, not, not yet. I don't like snow. I really don't. That being said, um, it's been suggested. Well, I want to welcome everybody, and, and I'm glad you're here. We've got a wonderful um, program tonight. But before that, um, there's a couple of things we'd like to acknowledge. Um, want to um, acknowledge uh, Paul Farmer's death. Um, I'm sure lots of you had had encounters with him. I um, served on several committees with him and he was really fun. I mean, I know he was a wonderful humanitarian, but he was a really fun guy. And um, whenever we go to the board meetings for um, SMA, <clears throat> first thing he'd do, because I'd start talking to him and he'd say, wait a minute, I got to go get my wine and I'm going to get my food before it goes away. And that was what he would do. It's like the, always the grad student. He never got out of that. Um, anyway, he was a wonderful, wonderful person. Amazing, very down to earth and so generous of himself and his energy. Um, the other thing is, uh, I want to acknowledge the, the terrible things that are going on in, in Ukraine right now and all over the world, frankly not only Ukraine. Um, so maybe we could have a moment of silence just to, to hope that this ends soon and ends well for as many people as possible. So. Okay, so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Martha, who's going to um, introduce us to our participants in our program tonight. Martha. Um, so welcome, everyone, and thank you, Suzanne. I was relating earlier um, when we first logged on that I felt like I never properly grieved uh, Paul Farmer's passing because two days later it was the invasion of Ukraine and frankly I was also so excited about tonight's program because um, for so much of this year my mental and emotional space has been taken up with climate issues so um, I'm here as the chair of the program committee if anybody ever wants to serve on the program committee please do it's a wonderful committee. Um, and uh, I was really glad that we were able to include not one, but it will be two programs this year uh, concerned with climate related issues. Um, I'll just give you some ground rules and then Emily will introduce our speaker. So um, as long as we stay a small group, it's fine to um, ask questions during the presentation. Just um, please wait until Jerry um, starts showing his um, slides because he, he feels it'll make more sense then. And then we'll have a very rich time for Q&A afterwards. Uh, the preferred way to ask a question is to use the raise hands function in reactions. But again, as long as we're a small group, you can unmute yourself and go, oh, you know, the elementary school thing. Um, and also, I'll be using the chat. People, so I don't, I don't know why people get shy about asking their questions. They put it in chat, and. Um, so I'll be looking to see if there's uh, comments or questions lurking in there. Um, Emily, uh, she is an amazing anthropologist, but she does not want me to talk about her. She wants the focus to be on our guest. So Emily, uh, would you please introduce Jerry? Well, it's my great pleasure and, and real honor to 
introduce my friend Jerry Moulds, who uh, became my friend in graduate school. Uh, we were uh, students in the uh, Department of Anthropology at Stanford University, and uh, Jerry received his doctorate, of course, from Stanford. Uh, after graduate school, he was a professor at the University of California at Davis, Pomona College, and he also lectured at the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, Stanford University, his alma mater. Uh, his uh, years as a professor were very rich, but he eventually said he would retire. But you will see, he never retired. Uh, Jerry's focus has been on rural anthropology, giving priority to action research, especially on the following topics. Preserving natural habitats, encouraging the wise traditional land use systems of past that are turning out to be our future, blending traditional cultures with environmental protection. Martha, you're not going to get away from climate change tonight, sorry. And developing new collaborative ventures for protecting global natural resources and using the knowledge and skills of indigenous peoples to do this. I love his approach, most especially because it's been my approach for the work that I do. And though we're in different fields, we think about the same. Uh, Jerry has worked extensively over many years in many countries. The principal countries are Sri Lanka, Peru, Mexico, Australia, Costa Rica, California, and the country called Appalachia, where he is now. He continues to work in Sri Lanka, Australia, Aust Aust I can't say it, Australia, and Appalachia, and he contributes to several global initiatives, especially in the fields of cultural preservation and the use of advanced technologies as well as traditional techniques uh, that are preserved by many indigenous cultures. Sometimes you have to search, but he finds them. In Sri Lanka, he is the chair of the board of what is called the Neosynthesis Research Center Limited, which is quite a huge enterprise uh, that is a planning center that develops financially beneficial and environmentally sensitive enterprises. He was the founding board member of the Watershed Research and Training Center in Hayford, uh, California. So he not only taught there, he was also uh, working for the development in the region. And there he developed collaborative ventures with local entrepreneurs, state and federal agencies, local governments, and financiers. And it was the base of a lot of his work that he has done in changing policy, uh, program structures, organizational structures, and innovating over time with the support of government and different types of NGOs at all levels. He is the founding member of the International Analog Forestry Network in Costa Rica, and he has served on and continues to serve on this advisory board and committees for the Secretariat for International Land Care in Australia and is a fellow of the Global Evergreening Alliance. Jerry descends from a family of deep, with deep ancestral roots in rural Virginia. And upon his retirement, he returned to his region to help develop agriculture, improve the economy, and begin an array of climate-friendly initiatives. To me, this is what life should be contributing from your heart and with your capacities, your skills, to the betterment of people and systems around you. Jerry is the founder of the Grayson Land Care Incorporated, a well-known uh, initiative in Southern Virginia. He is the founding board member of Sustain Floyd Incorporated. I think he will talk about that tonight. And at Virginia Tech, he has been doing some things that just leave me astounded. He's an advisor to the Appalachian uh, uh, Food Shed Project, the Virginia Beginning Farmer and Rancher Coalition, and the Center for Natural Resource Evaluation and Decision Support. 
the work that he is doing in that domain combine advanced biochemistry and uh, medical approaches with uh, sustainable agriculture and the use of traditional approaches. It's just fascinating and you will see. Jerry is the author of many publications and treatises, far too many to, to be listed by any means. And his topics for most of his publications focus on the importance of preserving natural habitats, encouraging wise traditional land use systems, and the meeting of uh, the, really the meshing of traditional cultures with initiatives for environmental protection. And with that introduction, I turn it over to Jerry to tell us his story. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thanks to WAPA for the invitation and the opportunity to share some of my experiences. But before I start, I have a promise to keep. Uh, some of you may know this. On uh, Saturday, there was a party in Napoleon House in New Orleans, and people came from a number of countries, or I'm sorry, a number of states in over the Mexican border, I'm told, um, to New Orleans. And then a couple hours later, they joined in a parade with music, I think, and paraded to the Mississippi River and paraded back. I promise Katie Moran's daughter that uh, since I couldn't come to the party, I would dedicate my presentation tonight to her life and memory. So for Katie, here you go. You were amazing. I, it's an impossible person to describe. As her daughter said, when she finished high school, her parents gave her a watch. She went to a pawn shop, traded it for a suitcase, and she was on. She came to Sri Lanka to study the Mounts, the uh, people that manage the elephants. And on behalf of the American Zoological Society, which returned to Washington at one time, she was with the director of Smithsonian. She worked in Congress. She represented um, Shaman Pharmaceuticals for a number of years in Washington and bragged on WAPA when I would go visit. So great set of experiences. And then when we came back, she even helped us with funding for Sri Lanka. She said, you have to be noticed. So we went to a bar and there was a guy madly in love with the torch singer. And she introduced me and he arranged for my Sri Lankan colleague and I to do a briefing on Capitol Hill to the congressional staff and um, in the House Foreign Relations Committee room. People in Congress said, this is great, but we don't know how to help you. I went back and said, well, Katie, we tried our best. She said, no, no, no. You take what you have now and go with it. We were introduced to the Humane Society. This led to one of the Beltway bandits, uh, an NGO counterpart. And they, we wrote a proposal together, $450,000, and we were on the road in Sri Lanka. So. That was her capability in Washington. It always amazed me. But let's go down to how I conceive of my practice. My practice is about understanding where I am at the moment. It's about trying to learn what is necessary to understand the situation I'm in to make a difference. And this requires a constant set of exchanges with the people who surround me. We went to villages when we first started in Sri Lanka and asked the villagers, teach us how we can help you because we have to understand it's their game, it's their place. And they're the one who's, who understand far better than we ever will. I, I'm reminded that life is a verb. And so it's an ongoing process. Maybe we don't have enough old anthropologists, but I remember a comment by Alan Holmberg about the Vicos Project. And this was one of the early examples of applied anthropology in Highland, Peru, and a tremendous success. It was even on a network CBS show. And they asked Alan, how did you succeed in this way? He said, I can't tell you, but it was innumerable small acts. So we live as part of a process. And so this is what you get used to. I'll 
spell out some steps along the way and share some res results as we go along. And let me say from the offset that this isn't just about rural. It's about the relationship of rural to the non-rural because the non-rural determines many of the outcomes. And so it's that set of exchanges that are ongoing that we have to focus on. If we think about life is defined by exchanges, this is the dynamic. We exchange with material things, boxes, books, what we can haul in the truck, computers, all those things we exchange. A more important exchange in many ways is energy. This is the food we receive, fossil fuels. Um, and this is the degeneration of life as it goes back into the soil. It's the cycles. I was always amazed with the Hindus in Sri Lanka. They said to the sun, oh yes, that's the sun god. And this is their worship. And you talk to some of the old swamis and it's a worship of photosynthesis. They say everything comes from the sun. I was also instructed that Agni, the sun god, is the link to all the other gods. And then it was explained to me that Agni arrives on a sunbeam. And so what our game is, and what our game is in Sri Lanka is about Agni. Um, and it's about the exchanges, the energy exchanges. And then there is that human created energy, which is omnipresent everywhere. It's called capital the capacity to command goods and services. And so when I'm sitting in the field and villages and markets, wherever, that is the machine, the power behind the machine that we see operating. So these are the things that are exchanged that I have to pay attention to. In addition, the exchanges are information. And if we think about this, we're all, we learn to look at things in nature and that's information we receive. We're predisposed to pay attention to, but also we share information. We organize our lives through sensory awareness, emotional senses of being, and cognitively formed interpretations of pre present circumstances and expectations for the future. So as I go out and deal with life, this, this is the things I have to pay attention to, the exchanges, the ongoing exchanges. And then I come to culture that dynamic will of the wisp that we've been trying to describe and explain for the entire history of our discipline. And I would think about, when I think about this over 4,000 years ago. Can you, can you take a picture of me? Hello, Papa, can you take a picture? I'm can sorry. You, oh, can you take a Where are we? Hello. We got you. Go ahead. Okay. We're listening. Go, go ahead. There was just uh, um, an interruption. Okay. Can you, can, um, the whole idea that uh, over 4,000 years ago, people in South Asia came up with the idea of Maya. Maya is illusion. And that's how it's translated into English. And what they discovered then, if there was a single truth, we would all see the world in the same way. And yet we're stuck with all of our unique histories. And so a lot of what I do is being very mindful of what I know and realize that others have equally secure truths in their own mind. And this has to be appreciated. As we join together for shared purpose, we are building a conceptual truth that we can live with. And so the exchanges go on and on. And in my role, I say, now, wait a minute, let's see if I can understand what you just said. I repeat back to them. I may add something about ecology. I may add something about economics, but then they re repeat back to me. And so this is an ongoing process. And we're always meeting new people. We're listening, sharing what we're doing. They're coming to their own interpretation, their own conclusions about what this is. But we realize that culture is a human creation. As an applied anthropologist, this is my playing field. This is the game that I must play. 
part of the difficulty that we have when we try to organize people is the creation of a reason why we've come together. What is our purpose? What are we doing here? The expectations of participants will differ greatly. And so what we're doing is an ongoing dialogue, finding a set of things that we can agree on what this is all about. And the blessing in this is things get the tide together through experience. And so as we go along, we continue to talk and we continue to learn. And I'll say a bit about this in a minute. Now, how things evolved, how outcomes are determined, depends on how much influence that rural people have. Given the diversity of landscapes, cultures, people, their histories, all of this is great diversity. And yet when we look at legislation in this country, we look at legislation and the work of NGOs in the UN in Sri Lanka, they have single answers, but we have to make those single answers pertinent to the landscapes and the people, and we are solving the people's problem, not problems from afar or else we will surely fail. The external part is a dynamic, I guess, status quo. And they are increasing their investments in capital in rural areas worldwide. Uh, here in the United States, there's something opportunity zones that was created in the last administration. What this means is you can purchase rural land, farmland, and if you hold it for 10 years, you pay no capital gains tax. Do you know who the largest farmland owner in the U.S. is? Bill Gates, and he's buying more and more. And the type of agriculture he's proposing is a lot of monocroppings, but this is true around the world. I had to deal with ag agricultural enterprise, USAID. They tried to grow gherkins and they sprayed fungicides twice a week and they finally gave it up. So this ignorance of what we're trying to do and being willing to listen to the people at the grassroots um, is caused failure after failure. You know, there, we have a large literature, not only in anthropology, but in other disciplines of unintended consequences. So it's that ignorance that we have to overcome, and that is done by listening. So rather than going with solutions in hand, the solution is engage, engaging in a learning process. Early when I was at UC Davis, I met Wes Churchman. He was a philosopher of all things in the School of Business, and he was also in uh, peace studies there. And he wrote a book, The Design of Inquiring Systems. And this was the beginning, you've probably heard of Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline, about the art and practice of learning organizations. So what my attempt is in all of this is to create a learning organization because each solution is just one more step. If we think about uh, what goes on in adaptive management in agriculture and ecology, each management prescription or each solution is a hypothesis that has to be tested, evaluated, and provided with feedback. One of the great dangers in forestry and agriculture, a whole series of things, is we don't evaluate each management practice and we get deep in trouble. Um, and a lot of our research, by the way, is to correct the problems we've caused rather than to go back and almost start over. So huge investment in continually making adjustments for our landscapes we've wrecked, where we flooded places, all of this is part of the difficulty. And finally, in one of my heroes in anthropology is Gregory Bateson. And he always said, the reflexive nature of being, and we're always given our past what we're attending to making sense of the future. And so this is the game in organizing people making sense of the present, and is this providing a stepping off point as we move forward? A um, couple of other things. Um, Sri Lanka has a written history of more than 2,500 years, and they have a forest management system that's evolved 
way beyond the 2,500 years. So this is something that made it very special. And why we call ourselves the Neosynthesis Research Center is we were taking modern science, ecology, anthropology, sociology, economics, soil science, et cetera, et cetera. And including that as we listen to the people and learn to create a synthesis of knowledge. And I'll say some more about that in a moment. As the ethnographer, or maybe better said, facilitator, mediator, or even secretary of the organization, my role became describing, reaching understanding on present circumstances and what was to follow. And so in a way, this is a creative cultural process that I was engaged in. And then people would correct me, say, no, no. And then I would say, well, do I understand this correctly? And I said, well, not quite right, but if you said it this way, that would be better. And so this is ongoing self-conscious creation of culture. Now let's get to some slides. Okay, thank you. This is Hakala. This is a mountain in central Sri Lanka, and it's written about in the Ramayana, which is a religious book written maybe four to five thousand years ago. And this was when the evil Ravana kidnapped Rama's wife Sita and took her off to Hakala, and she was held prisoner, and a great war ensued. And Rama was on his way and had to let Sita know, so she didn't despair. And so Hanuman, the monkey god, put Rama's ring in his mouth, turned himself into a small monkey and appeared to Sita. And she was thrilled that Rama was on his way. And nearby, there's a small shrine where they reconsummated their relationship when Rama arrived. So that's sort of a bit of history of where we are there. Now, if we can uh, move, move on, someone can click the, okay, and click again. Well, maybe I can do this. Vision, and this is what we've discussed, vision is being realistic and where you're headed with an understanding of the forces that maintain the present as experience. And so this is the constant discipline that you go through of making sure that you're basing your information, putting the information together. And these are the exchanges, the forces that maintain the present. And this is what we're attending to when we go into rural areas. What are the relationships to the soils? What are the relationships among the people? And what are their relationships to the outside with the wholesalers? They're called mudalalis there with government agencies, the forestry department, the ministry of agriculture. All of this becomes part of the game that we are involved in. Okay. Okay, and again. Okay, this is where we started from. And if you could click again. Okay, the person that uh, both he and his son invited me there, Upali Sainanayaka was the son of the patriot of the country that led the struggle against the British. As time went on, he found that rice yields had continued to, to decline. And as he looked at history, this occurred when the British took over and introduced the Gregorian calendar. And the kids had to go to school according to, in his mind, a foreign calendar. And they were no longer available to weed the paddy fields, a labor bottleneck. So he went into the fields himself back to his traditional village where his family had lived for over 850 years and went through a rice harvest. And he found the one thing he couldn't do was weed the paddy fields. His cousin by this time was prime minister. He convinced him to help organize the government. They organized the government. They sent 640,000 school children into the paddy fields and increased national yields by five bushels. This required the Ministry of Agriculture going to all the schools. At that time, all transportation was owned by the government. 
So the government provided transportation. When the children showed up in the field, they were carrying the school flag. They exchanged the school flag for the national flag with the Grama Sevica, the head cultivator in the village, symbolizing they had become responsible for the nation's food supply for that day. Next slide. Yeah, and just getting to work with him was amazing. And then he was stopped politically. Um, the political party that he supported lost, and so they stopped the weeding campaign. So what he did then was he organized 50,000 men in Kuranegala district to desilt the tanks, the earthen reservoirs. The earthen reservoirs also were changed by the British. There was a practice called Rajakarya, which you, each man owned 21 days to the king. How did you pay the king? You desilted the tanks or the earthen reservoirs and you repaired the roads. So your service to the king was really taking care of yourself. He got 50,000 men organized with the help of the Buddhist clergy. They went with elephants, water buffalo, and they cleaned out many of the tanks. And simply because people had two yields as opposed to one, they got at least 100% in most places and sometimes with better fertilization, capturing some of this good soil that was washed in, they did even better than that. Next slide, or next. Now the organizing of the two groups of Buddhist priests were very interesting because he trained these people to be his extension agents, in a sense. These were the intermediaries that went to the village. Now, we all know about the Tamil, Sinhalese, and Muslim problems there. And what Upali said, he said, as a Buddhist, I can only influence the Sinhalese, but if every Buddhist was a good Buddhist, everyone would do well because we would quit all this fighting and all this violence. But uh, with the support of the Buddhist clergy, uh, this made a huge difference. Next, please. So he created something called National Heritage Trust. He, re he reinterpreted the flag based on Buddhist teaching. And he's, his idea about how he did all of this was he was reflecting back to the people who they really were. He said, this is what you claim to believe in. How is it reflected in your practice? So that was his game. Next, please. Uh, but a long history of assisting with government. Okay. Please continue. More? Okay, the fundamentals of the village organization. Yeah, bring them all up and we'll go from there. And as he noted, the traditional villages were all tied to hydraulic agriculture. And so the responsibility of the temple was coordinating village activities, including agriculture. They would declare an auspicious day when the entire village turned out to irrigate the rice paddies. Um, when they had to do a weeding campaign and when the children were there, he would declare an auspicious, auspicious day, the head monk would, to get people out in the field. His intermediary was the Grama Sevica, the head cultivator. So the priest gave the order to the head cultivator who coordinated things at the village level. Now, interestingly, this is just an aside. When the British came, labor's valuable. They went to a village and they said, this is a waste of labor. You should irrigate this part of the village and then you go to this part of the village. And so it was gonna take them over a week to irrigate. But in the end, since these were unlined channels, they ran out of water because each time they released the water, it was absorbed. And so they had to go back wisdom of the traditional way. Next slide, please. Okay, this is uh, Upali's son that I met at UC Davis. He was a graduate student. So just keep clicking and we'll... Okay, as a young man, he got into natural history and he came to UC Davis to be a systems ecologist. 
He started solar farms, trying to figure out with only sun's energy what could be done. He started a snake farm to protect some of the native species. He started a little newsletter called Roots. And when I got there, we had an ecology page in a national newspaper. There are fish today in the aquarium trade that no longer exist in their original habitat. They only exist in the aquarium trade because of his work. He protected endangered plants in the landscapes. And please continue. And he's an advisor of national and international groups and agencies. Please go ahead. And he owned an, a coconut estate. And so the beginning of our experimentation occurred there. And please continue. And, more, and then this was the dynamic. As I say, we live in time. And there are th be three things. One more, please. And systemics. And this is where what we could control was plants through photosynthesis. And so as we started looking at the landscapes, what little of native landscapes, almost no native forests were still around, disturbed areas where people were continuing to cut trees out for fuel wood. And then the anthropogenic community and landscapes where in many cases that there had been agriculture for over a thousand years, in some cases over 2000. What we had to focus on is the exchanges of energy, material and information between and among species and individuals. And so what we were doing as we would think of plants, um, then what do plants need? And we would think of the soils and the microorganisms in the soils. What was the exchange of energies that made any of the systems we're going to deal with possible? And then we had to deal with the cycles, the hydrological, nitrogen, moon, tide, seasons. And of course, we had two monsoons there. So this, we had to pay, everything had to fit within this dynamic. Next, please. And, and here comes the anthropologist. And I include capital. And, and they picked it up in a snap. And then the idea, and this because the people I worked with just assumed that everyone shared information, which even they didn't with many of the villagers. The map is not the territory. And if we're going to exist, if we're going to be successful, we must understand how the people know and the complexities beyond anything we'll ever master. So many of the things can only be discovered through observation and experimentation. And so this, this was the beginning then of the Neosynthesis Research Center with these three sets of three people setting the information. Next, please. Now, what we were starting with was intensive hill and paddy agriculture with earthen reservoirs and weirwas. A weirwa is where the river turns a sharp bend and you just put a channel to capture the water running there. And so how far you could move perpendicular from water flow um, out into the fields was the paddy agriculture. There were two rice crops possible and sometimes people rotated because of emerging markets with annual vegetables, temperate zone vegetables. The places where you couldn't get irrigation water was turned into forest gardens. You fly over even today much of Sri Lanka and you think you're flying over forest. If you're down on the ground, you walk from one village to the next and there are some of the densest settlements you'll ever know. Sri Lanka has roughly 21 million plus people on a place the size of West Virginia or Costa Rica. The population is dense. And so the idea is that these people for centuries have learned how to take good advantage of the natural resource endowment that they receive. Next slide, please. Okay, value of the present system. And if you look at this present system, you can see then on the hill, there is the um, forest garden 
If you see in the background, this is a village that controlled tea estates. But as you look to your right, all of those trees, they're villages under that. Thousands of years of coevolution, low input. You, in the traditional system, there's no fertilizer coming in. And even when I wrote labor intensive, I have to step back a bit because these people went out and plucked their dinners. It surrounded them and they constantly cared for the forest garden. The amazing thing is how stable it was. Many of these villagers have been, their families have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And even when there are storms, cyclones come in, you can recover relatively quickly. And we'll say something about this later, but it produces a wide variety of products used in the village household. And I'll give you a hint right now, there, we found 165 food crops in these systems. And I don't even know how to think about that. No imported inputs, and it was sustainable until the British come. So we thought there's no need to reinvent. We start with what's present. Next slide, please. And this is the tragedy of the montane forest. And in coffee history, at one time in England, the beverage of the morning was coffee. And a lot of this came from Sri Lanka. And then a great blight occurred and thousands of acres perished. And so then tea became the caffeine of choice to the British. Now, if you don't take care of the land over time, the land erodes, soil will not hold moisture, streams perish. And this is what you see. These are mountains in Sri Lanka that had tea estates and the tea is gone. And so with the growth of, the, of landless populations, China or Sweden cultivation, they try to reclaim these mountains because this is the only land available. Next slide, please. Okay, in, this is our first field station. And this is right across from our field station. This is an old tea estate on the other side. And there's a house there. And over the years, we watched them. At first, they started lower down in the stream to get more water. As the soil lost its quality, uh, they kept moving up the hill. And you can see the smoke rising now where they are trying to tap into another little watershed to be able to stay alive. Very difficult to survive there. There's no secure title of land. A horizon of the soil is gone. Almost no soil moisture. The streams dry up after the monsoons and they have to carry in fertilizer just to get yields. And there's no way for easy transportation. We would see these people coming in with sacks of fertilizer on their back. And from the road, they had walked probably almost two hours. And after se several cropping seasons, they have to move. And so these people have been stable on the hillside, but they kept moving the field up higher and higher. Next slide, please. So the challenge is measurement of success. We have to stop soil erosion, clean, healthy water available, healthy food supply. And the big issue is we have to have income for the cultivator. It has to be to their advantage or why do they participate? And so our goal is to do all of this plus protect indigenous biodiversity. Next, please. Okay, now what is the model we're going to use? Click, click through and we'll go through relatively quickly. Watershed restoration. And so what we had to do, and this is how the first $450,000, much of it was spent, is we went into villages and did inventories of land use, of flora, the fauna, and we had an understanding of the ecological dynamics that was there. Determining successional stage, if you cut everything off, what are the su successional stages that occur? from annuals, grasslands, bushes, trees, and so on. We did inventories of species and had to have an idea of their role in the ecology. 
the idea of keystone species. If you get up to the bush level, then the bushes are the keystone species that are holding the land. We want trees. So what are the keystone species for trees to help then create forest gardens? And so we had to understand the successional stages. And then we separated natural and anthropogenic systems and made lists of the species for all the things, food, fiber, fuel, fodder, medicine, and so forth, uh, based on the Ayurvedic medical system. They designed their diets to protect their health. So that, and, and then they had medicine also in the forest gardens. Next, please. Okay, this is the natural forest are the design models. The most efficient solar system is natural forest in terms of total biomass production. The forest gardens we started to study have characteristics, three canopies, sometimes four, of the natural forest. And so what we did is we started replicating the design, structure, and environmental function of the natural forest using utility or marketable species. So if we can't have forest trees, we're going to put in a mango tree. We're gonna put in a whole series of other trees that serve the people. But what we're doing is we are stabilizing the landscapes. We're putting things back under forest and we have examples on the ground. Next, please. And here, here's a little thing we show people when we would go out, the successional stages. And if you'll look as you go across, the depth of soil is increasing. First cereal stages, we go on abandoned land. We would help them plant um, yams, manioc, a whole series of things that get the yield the first year. We would start putting in bananas, 18 month crop. And then we would go through other crops that serve the community, third cereal stage. And this is how we designed our work. Uh, one to five years, then a hundred to a thousand years would be our planning horizon. Next, please. Okay, here is the program design criteria, more of it. We have to respect traditional practices. You can't go in and say, change this, change that. We don't criticize. What we're saying is work with us to experiment. And I'll say something about this later, but we would go into villages and say, how much are you earning on your plot? Maybe five sixths of an acre. And they would say, well, I earn so much. And, they, and then we would say, can we lease that from you and pay you to change it and pay you for your labor and everything you're not receiving off the land? This is after we know what we're doing in our own experimental stations. And they would say, yes. But we're not saying you stop, do this, this is wrong. None of that ever happened. And the costs have to be very modest because we were doing this with local resources. And the rewards had to be based on the energies of the people. They had to find value in this and join in. And this restricts what you can do. There's a lot of freedom you don't have if you go in with wealth. This is based on the existing wealth in villages. Next, please. And so we set up village nurseries and we hired seed collectors. You just can't go down and buy seeds. There's no shop to buy the seeds in. So we hired seed collectors to go in certain areas, in certain forest gardens, and even sometimes in the native forest, if we we're trying to build a forest barrier around a river or various things. And then we created village nurseries. If you'll click on the next. This is a village nursery. That's our crew. And these are people that we raise very little money. Some of our programs we would raise $20,000 and we were good in a village for almost a year because wages were so low. Next slide, please. Now this is, this was just starting this nursery. And so if you'll look and there are the months across the top and how many plants do they have? 
and you see we have over 70,000 plants. And this is with the seed collectors and getting things together in the village. And we can expand a plant nursery that quickly in a year with the correct people. Next slide, please. These are the species in the nursery. And so you think about 165 food crops, and there are ornamental plants, but there are many plants that they, we, and we are limited by the seed collectors, but this was after a year in this one village, this many plants, this many species are going. Next slide, please. Okay, now time passes and all of a sudden people recognize what we're doing. And this is on Thomas Lipton's first tea estate. They want to solve some of their erosion problems. They want protection against the wind. And so you go from village to this, back up please. Okay, now how we got started is I ran two Pomona College semester abroad programs. And this allowed me to invite government, parliament, ministries, extension agents. And so I got to know the people through this. We invited university faculty to speak to the students. We went to the embassies. I had, back then it was, there was the USSR, they even sent speakers. The Chinese sent speakers. So all sorts of people showed up to speak to the students. We talked to the business community. And now this continued on after the students were gone. We got involved with Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist clergies. Um, we had, I, I even had cartoons in the national newspaper. The longest article ever in the Lanka Guardian, which was finally stopped by the government because it was criticizing the government was written by me. It took three issues to get it out. And so we were welcomed and we had things to say and we could make a difference. We started working with NGOs. They came to our experiments and figured out what we were doing and they started helping us extend this to other places. We work with cooperatives, farmer organizations and groups of friends. So all of this was creating a presence, a set of relationships that allowed us to function in Sri Lanka. Next slide, please. Okay, anchor stones. How do we know what we're doing? And you know, we can't afford to give bad advice to people who are on the threat of hunger. And so what we did is we got access to land and we set up two research demonstration stations. And then these are the anchor stones. People could come and see for themselves. We did different cropping systems. When I mentioned earlier, the successional stages, multiple species, we included annuals and perennial. A big issue is water management. How do you stop erosion? So we've set up erosion control, soil improvement, composting. How do you do pest control? We worked with an entomologist in India who developed ways that villagers could help, could control pests. We did classes on our research stations. We did listening sessions. We would invite farmers in and say, does this make sense? What are we doing wrong? How can we do better at helping you? And we also hosted potential funders. USAID would come, USAID would come, a whole series of people would come and visit and, and then they would understand, but this is the real life understanding experiential learning that in my mind has been key to our success. Next slide, please. And this is the other anchor stone in the villages. And the person that still runs our operation there, Camel, or I, I call her Cami Malvani. She made it happen on the ground. By the way, she has a PhD in, uh, from the, um, Environment and Livelihood Program at Charles Darwin University in Darwin, Australia. So she created all these collaborations with villages. She had village advisors and the design and everything she did was to serve family needs. And climate change is a big issue. Monsoons on the 
east side of the country fail one year. And so how do we start changing the way we manage landscapes given we don't have predictable weather into the future? We were reestablishing three canopy landscapes. We had to get the trees up to stabilize things. Um, we were ass assessing new markets, for example, getting people certified organic, getting a small French company to come in and set up a refinery because the fishtail palm produces a sugar that diabetics find safer than cane sugar. So we were doing little things like that to have markets. And then as we, if we couldn't find villagers to let us take over their land, we would rent land and create nurseries to produce trees. As we left the village after we'd worked there, we would turn the nurseries over to the villagers. And a number of villagers now have commercial nurseries. Then they sell plants to the region. Is there one more? Yeah. Now what has happened is Cami then, after all this experience, this, we've been going for 30 years, took all that we'd learned and put it in a farmer's handbook. And this farmer's handbook is attracted all sorts of attention because what it is, is the integration of Western science with traditional knowledge. And we've taken botanists, all sorts of people into these villages. In fact, we found one guy, he was a British scientist and he would listen to the, he would find species that were unlisted and he would have them described by the villagers. And that's how he was discovering new species because the villagers knew far more than a foreign scientist showing up for maybe the third or fourth visit. So the farmer's handbook has made such an impression that Kami was flown to Bangladesh twice. And so they are in the process now of mimicking the Neosynthesis Research Center and creating farmer's handbooks there. And then I'll never understand this, but the Japanese aid agency flew her twice to Mongolia to start developing a farmer's handbook there. And it is so different from tropical vegetation she was used to, but they are in the process of putting together a farmer's handbook. This is the synthesis. And if anyone would like to see, and it, it's in three languages, it's in, the three languages of the island. It's in Tamil, Sinhalese, and English. And if you would like a copy, you can just send me an email and I can send you a website where you can pull it down. Next slide, please. Now, these are Tamil women and they look back, they have showed up to receive the farmer's handbook. And they come and it's introduced. And by the way, the um, Minister for Women's Development also would come to these meetings with us. And she was into the handbook too and what it meant. And so, all, and you, you'll notice the women, some are dressed in green and some are dressed in blue. Each village had its own dress. If you look at the plastic they're setting on, blue and green. And so these are the agricultural committees of women in these villages. Next slide. Now beyond the village, and this is a good example of what you can do with trees. In the Kalpatiya Peninsula, and this is on the west coast, and it's basically a sandy, of area and we were finding outbreaks where the government was finding outbreaks of blue baby syndrome and spontaneous abortions. They called in engineers. Well, 54% of the infants had levels above the normal range because of the nitrites, because where did the nitrites come from? If you're growing things on sandy soil, you're continually adding fertilizer. In this area was a place where you grew tobacco, for a commercial market. Also tomatoes were grown here. And so it was the continual adding of um, nitrogen fertilizer. Well, and then they, they had the engineers come in and the engineers wanted to build cement water control systems around, but it was too expensive 
for the government to afford. So we proposed to them that we could, and we did a demonstration, we could clean up the wells by planting deep rooted trees to absorb the nitrogen. We used to joke, if you drop a seed, stand back with all that nitrogen in the soil, the tree will knock you over, it's growing so fast. And this turned out to be the case as we planted up around each well with all trees in smaller vegetation, annuals also, we cleaned up the water in four years. Now, this simple innovation, you know, it's, it's just planting trees, no engineers needed. Once it was discovered in the entire region, this simple technology was ex extended to over a thousand wells and provided safe potable water for a million and a half people. And, it, and again, we're just using vegetation, we're using plants, we're using trees to make this happen. Next slide, please. Okay, the two, 2005 tsunami, and this swept the island. We were assigned by the government a village, Kamalnai, and all of a sudden, you know, the place was devastated. Of about 30,000 people, they lost around 3,000 people in the two waves that hit. Luckily, it was on a Sunday. The schools were devastated. And so the first thing we did when we sent our staff down, we hired new staff, is we started distributing food and drinking water. We, and the wells were filled with salt water. We had to start cleaning the wells and every toilet in miles was knocked down. So we became pros in building toilets and we provided school supplies. And for craftspeople, all of their equipment was gone and we started helping them get the materials they needed to go back in business. We kept careful records, 8,616 adults and 8,009 children. We reclaim land by adding organic material to restore farmland. In some places near the coast, we were able to get pumps and we would pump fresh water to dilute the salt that had penetrated the land. And um, then we planted a three kilometer conservation forest to protect the town. Now, interestingly enough, when the tsunami hit, it would tear every leaf off a tree, but the tree still stood, tall palms still stood. So the idea of taking native vegetation and creating the three kilometer uh, wall of trees was a way to protect the town into the future. And especially with the rise of the ocean, um, this was something that we felt was needed and something that we could do. In addition to this, we, um, cleaned up micro watersheds around the thousand and one wells doing the same thing we had done in the other example. We de develop regenerative farming, lots of composting. We would even in the fresh water, harvest water hyacinths and let them decay. They break up very quickly, putting those in the soil that was so damaged. And so Five years later, farmers in this area could support themselves. They were food secure and generated income despite a severe drought. Next slide, please. Now, this, this is a fascinating thing. I mentioned the 165 food crops. And if you think about these people and for maybe 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years, they had selected the things that benefited them. And so what we've done here is 51% of the crops are consumed, 49 are sold to generate income. And as you click, it'll go around the circle. And uh, these are the things that they produce. Leafy green vegetables, vegetables, fruits, lots of fruits. Um, and then in this, well, we can, we can go on to the next slide. Now, it, look at this. If you go across the top, you'll see long-term crops, short-term crops, and very short-term crops. And then if you look when you can harvest, 
and then go through the months, you will see that there's always food there. Something is always being harvested. And so this gives an invitation of these ancient systems and how they serve the people. For the people, the nutritional people that come out and looked at what we were doing, there is no hunger season. Now, more importantly, um, without the hunger season, there's no hidden hunger. Hidden hunger means people are not getting an adequate set of nutrients. And over time, these people have selected nutrients that have served them well and kept them healthy. Part of this is the Ayurvedic medical system. By the way, traditionally, you paid your Ayurvedic physician as long as you were healthy. When you got sick, you quit paying. And so it was her or his job to get you back healthy. But in old systems like this, and now we're talking to the Global Evergreening Alliance, are these the kind of models when we're trying to plant forests all around the world? Can the forest we're planting serve the people in this way? So that's my Sri Lankan story. Now, next slide, please. Okay. Back home in central Appalachia. I'm working in the um, watershed of my birth. Now, the thing we have to realize is all this work in Sri Lanka has taken years. Uh, I missed it on a slide, but in 2007, um, Jane Nona's income was less than $100. She was one of the first adopters. She got in and rebuilt her house. She did all sorts of things. One time I went back and there was a solar collector on top of the house. She had TV and at night all the kids would come in and I said, we know, have no need to advertise further. But the interesting thing with her success, she was so successful, she was creating jobs for other villagers. And I think equally important, what was going on is other villagers saw what she was doing, just copied what she was doing and they too became successful. So in the Appalachian things, I've been doing this for about 15 years, but I wanna say something about another project before I go to Appalachia. After coming back from Sri Lanka, I was off the UC Berkeley campus. I was a mediator between the timber industry and the environmentalist over the Endangered Species Act, the Spotted Owl, and then the Marble Murelette. And in dealing with this, we created five community organizations and we combined both the timber beasties as they were called and the tree huggers. And they started discussions. Of those five organizations, three 24 years later still exist. One is nationally known and represents, it's called the Watershed Research and Training Center and represents examples of solving problems at the ground level in cooperation with Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, uh, two Native American groups, um, loggers, a whole series of people have come together and this goes on. Now in central Appalachia, we're finding high value markets for locally per, um, high value markets that can be met while protecting the natural resource endowment and improving livelihoods. And that final set of slides that I, I sent, the second um, attachment that I sent over, if we could open that and if that would be next. Just give me a moment, please. Okay. Uh, um, while while Martha is pulling that up, I uh, wonder if I could ask a, a quick question. Yes. Uh, so if I understand correctly, a cornerstone of your methodology in Sri Lanka was to focus on building forests. Uh, there's some correlation between deforestation and infectious disease outbreaks, particularly zoonotic outbreaks like Nipah virus. In working to reverse deforestation, did you note any improvements in infectious disease rates for the area? That's something we didn't monitor. Okay. The blue baby syndrome and spontaneous abortions, the uh, Ministry of Health monitored that. 
And so that improved. But other than that, no illness monitoring. Okay, thank you. Hi, Jerry. Um, Hi. Uh, Jennifer Talkins Balding with the National Park Service. And I really appreciate this presentation. Um, one of the things that we are thinking a lot about in this current administration, which is very interested in um, incorporating uh, a, col a collaborative stewardship model in public lands and federal lands. And I'm very interested in climate change, traditional knowledge and, um, and integration. And one of the questions that we always get asked, and we always are trying to answer this in multiple different ways, depending on who we're talking to, but, but it's sort of that, how do you do it question? It's the, it's the lack of trust um, from Western science that traditional knowledge is valid, that it works, and, um, and how, how, how are we to integrate that? And the best models that I've seen are actually just doing it, just doing the collaborative work, as you say, just, just putting things together, having people work on interdisciplinary teams, working with traditional knowledge keepers and tackling problems. Um, some of the things that you said tonight, you know, you said something like, rather than go with a solution in hand, let us engage in listening. And I think that that's a really powerful thought. Um, and I just wonder if you have any reflections on, you're very applied and I really appreciate that. So I wonder if you have any reflections on how, how did you answer those kinds of questions when you had naysayers and uh, any reflections on a current state of things where uh, multiple federal agencies are trying to do this work right now with, um, not only tribes, but also other types of traditional knowledge keepers in Appalachia and other places. Well, I, I think your first stop is to Google the Watershed Research and Training Center in Hayfort, California. Yeah. And they are good. And, and the woman, Lynn Jungworth, that founded this was one of the most remarkable human beings. She, you know, she, she even went to congressional hearings to talk about her success. Mm -hmm. And she changed just out of sheer willpower, uh, how land was cared for. She worked with Forest Service. She worked with a community college to train new forest specialists that were hired by the Forest Service. She worked with a forester and they were hiring Mexican crews to go in where you did pre-commercial thinning and they would cut all these trees out. And, she, and her husband realized you could cut a four before out of that. They took it down to Fresno State, checked on the tensile strength. And yes, a four before is good because it was shade suppressed. And so then the next thing that happened is they took these small mills pulled by pickup trucks. And rather than burning these trees in the rainy season, they marketed these and for every acre they could harvest them free or they would accept forest service money and they could sell the timber. And so there were jobs created. And so it's being creative <clears throat> in looking at the resources and having innovative people there to think things through. Uh, then we looked at all the weeds growing up after they harvested someplace in the national forest and frontier herbs came in and selected plants that they would buy and then summertime jobs for the high school students. Mm -hmm. And so if you just start looking around and being sensitive, it's all there. It just requires the attention to put it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. And incidentally, everyone I meet, I think they're there to help me if I can just figure out how. But this is one of the most amazing, exciting things. And this is when someone comes around, they're there to help. This guy came down from New Hampshire and he was working with the guy who created the food system for Apple employees in California. And they wanted to link, because we have a lot of water, we have rainfall. 
that he wanted to link the production of fish with the production of vegetables. Well, that never worked out, but this guy who came with him said, well, you, you know, let's keep talking. We'll find something else to do. One of his neighbors, husband and wife were producing specific pathogen-free sheep, free of 53 pathogens. And what are these sheep used for? They're used for medical research. Medical research needs these sheep because if you don't have the pathogens, then you don't get confounding results in your experimentation. And so we started talking. I had one of the lead farmers that I work with go up and visit them and say, is this real? He came back and said, this is amazing stuff. So let's go down to the next. And these are two people. Richard Hurley is an expert on um, animals for medical research. And uh, he, he works for big research facilities, <coughs> Boston Scientific, three of the big research hospitals in Boston. And he claims to be an expert on mice up. And so they developed these sheep, he and his wife, Julie, to serve in medical research. And these, if you want to go in to visit the sheep, uh, it, the specific pathogen-free ones, you put on a hazmat suit, and take a shower before you go in. There's that kind of pr protection. A lamb in Virginia sells for $180. These sheep sell for $4,000 and up. Now let's see, let, let's move up again. And yeah, all the customers are missing. But I know many of the customers, Harvard, Yale, um, the VA hospital in San Francisco, there are about 15 big research groups, Boston Scientific, Children's Hospital, Johns Hopkins, Wake Forest, the names just go on and on and on about who the customers are that they're already selling to. The problem is they can't expand production. They have limited land, plus they don't have a long growing season, so it's very expensive. They have to buy most of the feed. So the demand on their production is so high, they have to expand. In addition to this, not only the medical research, but regenerative medicine has emerged. And regenerative medicine is being funded by Big Pharma, the Defense Department, investors, and there's something called Army, the Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute, which is a nonprofit, which money's pouring into. This year, maybe $34 billion in, is invested in regenerative medicine. I said on Zoom calls where they talk about taking an animal kidney, taking the scaffolding out, which is collagen, and then taking the patient's stem cells and re-inhabiting the kidney. And they say, we will have replacement kidneys by 2026 to 2028. They're already rebuilding ligaments with the um, bone marrow from the hind legs of the sheep. Um, and these are repairing ligaments in our ankles, knees, hips, wrists, elbows, and shoulders. And so this booming new type of medicine is emerging. And then Julie, the name was mentioned above, is on the standards committee. And so she's in a position as we go more and more into the use of what they call animal derived products, they say ADMs, then we're in a position to start setting the standard based on the work that they're doing in New Hampshire that will move to Virginia. Okay. And it just says a new company. It's, um, we, they wanted to call it ANOVA, I think. That was SPSS to call up analysis of variants, but this is what they wanted to call the company, Appalachian New Ovis, Virginia, a new company. We have already formed the company. We are working with Locust Impact Investing. They are investment operation that invests the money of big foundations, plus they also provide services. We now have a pitch deck, a teaser, and a prospectus, and we're starting to invite this month in investors to look at what we have prepared. To get started, we need about $16 million. Okay.
And this just lists our collaborators, everything from the Virginia Tech Foundation um, to uh, schools of veterinary medicine, Lincoln Memorial University, Virginia Tech, um, the state of Virginia, the De Department of Food and Agri or let's see, in Virginia it's different. It's called the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. So this was a whole list of the people that are collaborating with us. Uh, and since we've been at this for about 15 years, we have a long list. We get great support from state government. Part of the uh, building of the pitch deck and prospectus was paid for by the uh, Virginia Department of Agriculture um, and Consumer Services. And a lot of the planning money came from Opportunity Appalachia, which is money set aside by both government and private groups and uh, to pay to develop industry in the Appalachian region. So next. And that was a long list. And you can, in this list, all our strategic partners, which um, in, I mentioned most of those, so we can just go on from there. Now, this is ANOVA. We're into the Wounded Warrior Project. The Defense Department tells us that soon they will understand the genetics of each soldier so well that when wounded, they will have the capacity to prepare me medicines specifically to treat an individual's shoulder. We've, um, New England OVIS has been working with them, tissue engineering to repair the ear, building better knees. Um, and then there's a the ghost heart, which is very interesting because they've just started now exploring replacement hearts. And so we've sent a sheep heart to this research group it's called biofabrication or biofab is its short name. And so they've taken the scaffolding out of this heart and they've started experimenting how do you get the patient's stem cells to go and repopulate the heart. Well, it turns out right now that the sheep heart makes it too complicated. So they're turning to rabbits and I don't know how far back rabbits go in our genetic history from sheep. But anyway, it's a much more simple thing. And so they're starting to experiment with taking the collagen or the scaffolding out of uh, rabbit hearts and um, moving from there. So this, this is an exciting thing that we can take agriculture and go into things at this level. And it, there's one more, but I think it won't show up either. Yeah, and the next big things in regenerative medicine, um, it's a long list. And um, we've also raised money. We, we have matching funds now from the Tobacco Commission of Virginia to build an abattoir or a harvest facility. We've done experiments on forage management, grassland management to um, bank grass. It's called rotational grazing with single strands of barbed wire. And rather than let the animals harvest in an entire pasture, we move them from place to place to place and then let the grass recover. And um, in doing this, we can feed cattle year round. And this has basically eliminated the cost of putting up hay. And we get very little snow now. And so all of this has gone ahead. We've probably raised close to three, I guess $300,000 more or less plus a lot of volunteer energy that's gone into all of this. Wow. Are you ready for more questions? I'm good to go. Okay. Let's see if anybody has, I don't see any um, questions quite yet. Uh, are there any questions in the in the chat box? No, I don't see any. Well, then I'll ask a question. I'd like to know what has been your primary role from an anthropological point of view in the ANOVA project? What what has been the value added that you have brought in to the project, given your experience and your conceptual framework? 
Well, a lot of it, I talked about it in the beginning, uh, looking at the exchanges. And so a lot of that, you know, if we go back to an economic anthropology course at Stanford, some of the reading we had to do for the first year exam, a lot of that was in there, uh, looking at exchanges. And also, also, Roy Dondrati, one of our professors, had me take a course and I, I managed to set through and not take it. It was called Philosophical Foundations, the Theories of Choice. And this went through the whole background of the philosophical basis of formal economics. And this can be applied, it's about exchanges and how exchanges occur and what has value, how value is set. So all of this, as I go through making sense of things, and you, so let's say I'm dealing with a farmer and he's selling coconuts. Or a better example, last time I was in Sri Lanka, the fishermen's union asked to meet with me to talk about how to organize themselves. And what they wanted to do, the Mudalalis, the people that did the purchases for the supermarkets, they wanted to take their place. And there was this big battle going on. And so how do they organize themselves? And because they caught the fish and their family should sell the fish, so how do they get the supermarkets to buy the fish they're already buying, but pay them? And so we had long discussions with that. And we went back about how to organize all the stuff I talked about organizing. We went through that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the anthropology. And, and the, the, then the whole assumptions we make, the, the Gregory Bates and stuff, the reflexive action. Um, and each time we were labeling things based on our past experience in that process of reflection and labeling um, was extremely important. And there's the protecting of the producer, uh, yes. the agriculturalist from the middleman uh, or middle woman who can just rip apart the whole approach. And that's where they're moving from redistribution and exchange up into the market exchange and the capital. And they, they just, they can be just ripped off at that point uh, and are routinely from country to country. And, you know, it's almost hard for me to talk about my anthropology because it's so built in. Yeah, I know. And see, I've, I've been doing this for 40 years. <laughs> and and it's, it's just something I do. But the framework you presented at the beginning was almost identical to a lot of the things that I do in national policy planning and deriving literally from the people the answers and their views, uh, literally their cognitive domains with regard to those particular issues. And they don't know that I'm doing it, but just like you, I've got it so set in mind, I know what I'm doing. And then people afterwards, they watch it happen and they see oftentimes where there's conflict or potential conflict and they say, how'd you do that? And I realize it's extremely difficult to explain to them that I'm using a series of constructs. Yeah. And it's the same thing. So I understand what you're saying. And reifying those, making those understandable to others as you did, I thought very beautifully in your initial presentation is I think the, the secret. And then giving practical examples of each one as to how you apply it. I'm working on that, but I haven't gotten as far as I want to on that. Well, the, the other thing, and th this is more pertinent to the work up in Northern California, was not be confrontational. And I, I can remember because I was there was violence. You know, Judy Berry was blown up in her car and eventually died. Uh, there were fights. Women and timber were formed to go to the protest so their men wouldn't fight. It was the only position I ever had where I was threatened physically. Yeah. And after one meeting one night, this timber beastie came up and he was pushing. He said, I don't like what you're just yelling at me. And I just stepped back and I said, I'm so sorry. Tell me what I said that so upset you and I'll never say it again. Well, he didn't know what to do with that. He was trying to confront me. And I kept saying that, please, please tell me. And then other people gathered around and he disappeared because confrontation was his game. But if you don't confront, if you don't challenge, mm -hmm. you're there to understand. And that's how it works. That's what the, the, 
<laughs> right. Well, when, when I did these little things, this was with Humboldt State University and Forest Service people came and I talked about pointing your finger. Three fingers are pointing back at you, so put the finger down. <laughs> Uh, so, a lot of questions. Yeah, Matt, I, I believe it's from Matt, wants to know, over the course of this long-term work, what would you say has surprised you the most? Like, I'm surprised all the time. Where did sheep for medical research come from? Why are people telling me this? Um, you know, when I worked in Sri Lanka and all of a sudden someone shows up and says, we can do this. And, and Hindu Swami story, Arthur C. Clarke's partner was a former British commando who worked with Arthur for years. They had a big fight and um, Mike became a Swami, Siva Kalki. And he said, you know, what you have to do is uh, you have to pay attention. Well, you know, I wasn't listening. And he'd come over and explain the gods to me. And he'd say this God, that God. And he came over and explained Verona, the God of vastness and wideness, or the God of the oceans and the skies. And, you know, I would say yes. And sometimes I took notes on what he said. So he came back one day and he said, I have a new God for you. I said, what do you mean? I said, what's this new God's name? He said, Lord, the best is yet to come. And I started laughing. I said, come on, man. And there's no new God. He said, no, no, no. He said, this is a God just for you Westerners. <laughs> if you ever get the monkey mind under control because you think you're going to miss something out there, and if you don't pay attention, you will miss it, then you will learn to control the monkey mind. And then he laughed and he said, I just renamed Verona, the God of vastness and wideness, wideness still the mind. And, you know, all this fun went on. I went through Dharma talks. Dharma, in one of the translations from Sanskrit, is mindset. And a lot of our discussion, and, and part of the beginning thing I thought about was, uh, is there a mindset or a Dharma of anthropology? Do we have a mindset that enables us to go make a difference? So hanging out with the swamis and bhikkhus, the Buddhist monks, and all of that influenced everything, too. I, I was taken to visit this old bhikkhu. He died while I was there. And he was talking to Upali, the guy I mentioned. And they were speaking in Sinhalese. I could understand about one out of every 50 or 60 words. And they were just rattling on. And he finally said um, something to Upali. And Upali said, he wants you to move up in front. And he was sitting on a bed, so I sat right in front of him. And he said, um, what would you like to learn? And I said, I would like to learn about meditation. And all this was in Sinhalese with the Pali translating. This old man spoke in what I thought was a slight British accent. And he said, meditation is dealing honestly with what's on your mind at the moment. Mm -hmm. Knowing where it's coming from, what it's doing to you, where it's leading you. Meditation is all the time. This is the practice of mindfulness is another way to think about it. And so the whole idea of paying attention and understanding my own way of doing things and being introspective has been a part of this throughout. And, and you know, just, just to hang out with these guys was very, very special. Wow. Well, well, any other questions or comments? Okay, well, I think- Jennifer, did you wanna? I just wanted to say thanks for sharing with us tonight. It was a, a really, a really um, interesting and in-depth presentation. I really appreciate it. So thank you for sharing with us. Yeah. Yeah, and I have long experience with Forest Service. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I would like to thank you very much for the presentation, for your caring so much for all the people that you work with through the years, all you've contributed. And I'm just very, very proud of all you've done. Thank you. Thank you so much.
And to everybody, thank you for coming. And if you have any further questions, I'm sure that as you think and reflect on the presentation, and you may want to watch it again, I know I will, uh, then you, I'm sure that Jerry would agree to receive any questions later on, right? Yes, and, and also it's just an excellent example of integration of our Western approach, science approach to village level knowledge is the farmer's handbook that has taken off to Bangladesh and Mongolia. And also another version of it is being used by the Australian Aborigines that they, they are developing uh -huh. farmer's handbook. There's real power in this. I have a friend who works in um, Conservation International. She heads up all the work with traditional ethnic groups around the world. And she takes her children uh, oftentimes to meet these eminent wise people from culture to culture uh, and uh, those children will never be <laughs> usual American children. They're half Mapuche anyway and it turns out that her work is now being recognized and used by UNESCO, UNICEF, WHO, uh, the UN system as well as many international uh, agencies such as USAID. So mm -hmm. the we often hear young students asking, well, what can I do with my degree? Well, the answer is open your eyes to the world and see all there is to do because there's a lot and a lot of opportunities. Well, thank you very much for your presentation and thank you everybody who attended. And as I said, any additional questions you can ask later. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Yeah, one, one last thing, and this attends to Forest Service, but this is a constant battle for us in the U.S. We had it in Sri Lanka, is in, in Washington or in our state capital of Richmond or Raleigh or Frankfurt, whatever state it is, every regulation and every law has to fit everywhere. And given, <laughs> the, given the complexity of the earth, especially in agriculture and forestry, and the diversity of communities, they fit nowhere. Absolutely. And I work with a lot of extension agents and they, some of these guys, some of these women are just amazing because they create things that wasn't the intention of whoever created the law or the regulation, but it serves people. And it's that level of creativity among our extension staffs worldwide that are remarkable and they should be rewarded in some way. Yeah, that's true. Thank you so much. This has been great. I'm just kind of yeah. overwhelmed. Um, still processing, but it's amazing the, the work you've done. Thank you. Yep. I've been great. Right. Everybody. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, too. And thank you, Emily, for pulling this yeah. together, as oh, well as, of better. course, Jerry, for presenting and for all the work you've done over the years. And next month we will um, turn our lens on um, land management from a government perspective and okay. the things being done, you know, yeah, their perspective. All right, take Bye. care. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye. Well, Emily. Bye. Bye.